The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. I think we're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, session called a Virtual Curricular Innovation Across Three Continents. We have Matthew Good and Teresa Heath from the Carlson School of Management here on the Twin Cities campus. And they are going to be going through um, their presentation. I just want to let you know that they do have a question and answer time at the end. And since we are recording the sessions, I'm going to be walking around with a microphone. So if you do have a question, I'll um, ask you to speak it into the microphone so we get it recorded. If you're not comfortable with speaking into the microphone, if you want to write down your question, I can ask it for you. All right. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mandy. Um, once again, my name is Matthew Good. And this is my colleague, Teresa Heath. And we both work in the International Programs Office at the Carlson School of Management. And we'll be speaking to you today about what we call our virtual team project. Um, we're glad to see all of you some familiar faces and some not familiar faces. And I'll turn things over to Teresa. OK. So to begin, I want to give you a little bit of a context of where Matthew and I work and the programs that we work with. So we work with the Global Executive uh, MBA programs, Master of Business Administration. And first, to give you a little bit of a background of the Executive MBA program, this is an MBA program that's designed specifically for executives uh, in companies. So the students are a bit older. They have had a number of years, usually between 10 to 15 years of managerial experience and work experience. Um, they, as I said, are older, and they have a very busy, busy schedule. And so the EMBA program uh, classes are generally scheduled for weekends, Saturdays, Sundays, Friday, Saturdays, uh, once a month or a couple of times a month to try to make it more available and attractive to students who are working full time. So at the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management, we have three global executive MBA programs. The first is in Warsaw, Poland with the Warsaw School of Economics. We call that WEMBA. The second is in Vienna, Austria with the Vienna School of Economics and Business and we call that VEMBA. And the third is Guangzhou, China with Lingnan University College. We call that CHEMBA. So all together uh, you'll hear us using the acronym GEMBA which is Global Executive MBA Programs and it uh, encompasses all three of these. And I just want to reiterate that we do partner with universities in, um, in these countries. And so the uh, students that are attending these programs are living locally. They are Viennese, they're Polish, they're Chinese students. But often we do see students from all over Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia. In the China program, we often have students from India, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. And so we have a very diverse uh, student group within these three global programs. Faculty from the University of Minnesota will travel to these three different locations to teach in the courses. And often they partner with faculty members and instructors from our partner schools. So each of these, these uh, programs have a unique uh, structure in regards to perhaps their scheduling of classes, but there are a lot of similarities in curriculum. All of these programs uh, um, are taught in English, and so there is uh, an English uh, language kind of casual requirement where the students must be able to speak English, and they do go through an interview process uh, in, in their um, application process. And all of these students are considered University of Minnesota students. So even though they are not attending their courses here in the Twin Cities, they are U of M uh, students, they have access to U of M student services, and they receive a diploma upon their completion of the program. And just quickly to give you a historical background, the WEMBA program began 15 years ago, VEMBA 11 years ago, and the China program began nearly 10 years ago. It's uh, celebrating its 10th anniversary this fall. All right, thank you, Teresa. Um, well, now that you've heard a little bit about our programs that we work with, I'm going to share a little bit of background information with you about the Virtual Team Project itself. Um, to give you a little history, the Virtual Team Project began several years ago with just our Vienna and China Executive MBA programs. And over the years has come to include what we call SEMBA, which is the Carlson School's US Domestic Executive MBA program here at the U, as well as our Warsaw Executive MBA program. So the Virtual Team Project as it exists today integrates and connects all four of our Executive MBA programs. Um, 
the primary focus of the project in terms of deliverables from the students is um, we form the students into teams and each team of students needs to select a product or service that they're going to propose launching in an overseas market. And it's up to each team to decide what that product or service is, what market or markets they launch that product or service in. As I said, we form the, the, the student teams as administrators of the project. Um, we spend a lot of time and thought on, on forming those teams. Each team is composed of about six students, and we make sure that every team includes at least one student from all four of our executive MBA programs. We also look for a balance in terms of the gender of the students on each team, as well as which business sectors the students come from and what type of professional role they have within their companies. Um, and in terms of deliverables, there is this comprehensive business plan that each team must create. Uh, which we call their project report. And the, the students also come to the Carlson School in May at the conclusion of their degree programs to present their business plans to their fellow students and to the faculty evaluators. So that's another key piece. Um, in terms of timeline, um, in October is when we create the teams. Um, in November, we do an initial rollout of the teams, um, the initial scope of what the project is, roll out the technology platform, which we'll be talking more about in a minute. Um, and give the, time, the teams time to form and, and get together. And then in December, we roll out the full project plan and the full scope of the project to the students. At the end of March is when the students' project reports or business plans are due. So just this last weekend was a really critical deadline for the students and for us. All 28 of our students' virtual teams submitted their project reports to us, which is always an exciting and anxious time for the students. Um, and then in May, as I said, all the teams come here to, to the University of Minnesota and present their business plans to each other. Um, in terms of curriculum, this is a four-credit academic course in all four of our executive MBA programs. It differs slightly um, in terms of what the course is and how it's set up, but it is a four-credit academic experience. Um, it's designed in a curricular sense to really integrate the curricula of all four programs around this key component. And it's designed to give the students an opportunity to apply the core MBA concepts that they've learned throughout their degree program in, the, in this international context. So we just thought we'd, to make it a little more real, share a, a, a photo with you. This is a, one of our teams from last year, composed of students from all four executive MBA programs. This photo was taken shortly after they met for the first time face to face. So they'd been working together virtually for six months. And they just met, um, and uh, the photo was taken. And it's always really fun to be in the room to see all the excitement of having worked virtually for so long and then getting meet, to meet face to face. So with that, I'll turn it back to Teresa, who's going to talk more about um, how the Virtual Team Project has helped in terms of internationalizing the curricula of our executive MBA programs. OK. okay. So we've divided the Virtual Team Project uh, into these two really important components, uh, the logistical aspects of working internationally and then the intercultural aspects of working internationally. Logistical, by that we mean more the nuts and bolts, the details and structures of working within this program and, and making it work. And then the intercultural is the relationship, the communication side of the project. Um, so I'll be, I'll be going a little bit more in detail into the logistical aspects. Um, Matthew will be coming back with the intercultural aspects. There are really different implications between these two, um, but they're both very important when working internationally. And they can affect the success of, and they not only can, they do affect the success of the others. So if we do not take into account the very my, minute details of the, this project, it can have ramifications in the way that these groups are, are meeting and forming relationships. And we really want to avoid situations where students are mistakenly taking something that might be a, a, an issue that has come up that might be due to technology, it might be due to the clarity of our communication, um, the expectations of the program that we've been communicating to them, and then to they, they may attribute that to the intercultural um, aspects, the cross-cultural communication. We really want to avoid that, um, and, and, and vice versa. They do play in with each other, but we really want to avoid, when possible, enforcing those um, stereotypes when it could be simply a matter of, um, of technology. And so it's really Im important and critical for us to look at both of these and to identify them and also to manage them um, both separately and to look at how they interact with each other. 
So some of the logistical challenges and how they play out in the virtual team project are time zones. Uh, with our program, we have three time zones that we're working in. Um, in the United States, between the United States and Europe, it's a seven hour difference. Um, actually, for two weeks, it's a six hour difference, which I didn't realize until last week um, when they changed their time. And with China, we have a 12 hour time difference. Um, and so when we're talking about these time zones, it means it, it can affect the way that we communicate to them when they receive the information. Um, it affects how they interact with each other in regards to. Uh, their deliverables and making, let's see, making good timelines and realistic timelines for when they can expect editing changes to be sent back to them um, and that delay that can happen. And also the difficulty in doing live meetings and the realities of executive students um, working in different time zones trying to meet uh, on a conference call when one person's meeting at 7 in the morning, one at 2, and one at 9. I think that's right about, usually that's when they, when they meet. Um, secondly, some challenges with working students. These are executive students. Um, they very often don't have a lot of time to be exploring new types of technologies, um, reading dozens of emails, and they may not be looking at all the emails that they receive right when they receive them because they're receiving emails from work, family, and all of that, all of the other um, aspects of their lives. And so that also plays into how we schedule, um, working with, with these students having a very clear schedule from the very beginning. And then the, and the uh, third uh, challenge that I'm going to be talking about are the four distinct programs. So we have, um, as I mentioned, we have three global programs. We also have a domestic program that, we're, that Matthew and I are working with. And so scheduling communications and the place of the program, even though there are slight changes, there are slight changes. And so that might affect the way that information about the um, project uh, is communicated to the students. And so also we have the role of offices within these four programs. When students have questions, who do they ask? Do they ask their program um, managers in their, uh, in their program country? Um, do they communicate to a faculty member? Do they communicate to Matthew and myself? And how do we communicate that to the students so that they have clear expectations of what they should be doing? So talking a little bit about the strategy. So how do we work with those challenges? And so first, in regards to timelines and communications, having very clear um, project documents. So being very clear, being very concise, and we want to leave as little room for interpretation in regards to the hard facts of the project. Um, deadlines, expectations for projects, and, um, and I have a, a brief example of that that we just encountered this past week. Um, I was and this actually also takes into account our time zones. I was in Vienna for the orientation of the incoming cohort of students. And while I was there, my colleague, the program director of the Vienna program, was receiving uh, emails from the students asking, let's see, asking a number of different questions. But one specific question is, when exactly was the project due? And looking back at the project deadline, we re or project document, we realized that we hadn't put down a specific time, um, which was surprising, actually, because we have come up with this uh, just as, as a question in the past. And so then we had to quickly decide, OK, so we don't have a time. So when we say midnight, do we read midnight Central Standard Time in the United States, Central European Time, or or are we saying that it's going to be Saturday when we say midnight? Or does that mean Friday? And it, it, um, it caused a lot of questions. And being in Vienna with the deadline on Friday, that meant that we had to decide and then communicate to all of our programs within an hour um, to be able to get that information to the students. But even though we did communicate it to the program offices literally within an hour, I think the students had already communicated to each other um, 
the <coughs> new expectation before they even receive the communication from us. So it's a very fast uh, communication style of the, pro of the students when they're really into the program. <coughs> and that also kind of goes into um, regards to making sure that you're anticipating the questions and the confusion before you um, launch. So if we are putting together a project document, we want to make sure that we're anticipating all of the questions because we don't want to come into uh, these types of situations where we have to make a split second uh, decision and then have it communicated across literally a, a dozen countries. Um, and also in regards to working with four other programs, is the challenge of are these students um, from each of the programs receiving the same information? How is how are things being communicated to them? And so one uh, one idea that we had this year that we implemented was a virtual lunch. And so being at the University of Minnesota, uh, we're really fortunate to have a lot of um, a lot of availability of technology. Uh, however, we did have to do a lot of exploring to see how this could be done, and also. Um, I should give a little bit of background of what the virtual launch looked like. We decided that um, we would tape a presentation and then have it streamed, um, recorded and streamed to our program offices in Warsaw, China, um, Warsaw, Poland, Guangzhou, China, and Vienna, Austria. And this presentation was part of the domestic program. The domestic program here uh, uses the virtual team project as part of a, a class. And so the faculty member does a presentation every year. So what we decided this year was to make that presentation open to all four programs and have it relevant to all four programs. And we also decided to include in that, um, that launch more of the practical and detailed logistical information. We recorded it and we sent it out. And it was a great success because by with that, we knew that all of the students were receiving the exact same message at the exact same time. Um, we knew that they had all heard the same thing. And that was really helpful for us. And it was also a really big success with some of our programs. Um, some of the students thought that it was live in, uh, in, our, in one of the programs and were actually waving at the computer or when they were watching it, thinking that they were waving at us. Um, and then also, this really brings to light the uh, virtual communication within our administrative staff. So recognizing that we are a virtual team ourselves um, within the four program offices, and so looking to ways that we could connect virtually. So using Skype um, was one of the big steps that we took, and meeting and discussing um, what was working, what wasn't working, feedback that people were hearing so that we could uh, have some more in-depth conversations about that. We could um, address any questions that the administrative staff had, and we could talk about strategies. And in regards to collaboration, it's really key um, for this program, um, the virtual team project, excuse me, and for making it successful. And um, also, it's, it's also really challenging because as we are um, some of the key administrators of the program, um, we need to make sure that we're, pro we're, we're creating an environment where questions can be asked and where change can happen. Um, we inherit a lot, of, uh, a lot of aspects of the program, but we need to be, we ourselves need to be open to change as um, all of the administrators and really encouraging questions. And even when we're not hearing that many, um, maybe finding different ways to make it open to our, to our colleagues. So asking questions, asking them again, finding different ways to ask those questions, and having these Skype calls have been really successful in doing that. Okay. So the second group of challenges that I want to discuss are technology challenges. And so as we have students from all over the world, internet access and firewalls um, are different realities in different places. So as our students are executives, a lot of times in their businesses, they may not be able to um, access certain programs. They might not be able to download Skype, and perhaps their business computer is the only computer they have access to. 
um, firewalls at their jobs, and then also their, uh, our countrywide firewalls that we're working with, making sure that systems that we choose um, to use are going to be uh, available in other countries. Uh, so we started thinking about collaborative sites. And we, I think we, we talked a lot about this both with, um, within, between ourselves and also with our, um, our global offices about what's the, what are the positive aspects of using a collaboration site. So you mentioned these are executive students. Um, so they are used to, um, they're, they're you know, very much technology savvy um, in a lot of ways. And um, so do we want to force a collaboration site or do we want to have that uh, be created organically? Um, however, with a collaboration site, there's also the question of if we have access to it, then we can also see how students are forming and how they're working together and the participation of the students. And then that goes into university supported and non-university supported. Um, should we should we look for something that um, that the university can can design that we can design through the university or you know there are dozens literally hundreds of different programs that students can use that aren't part of the university Google a lot of the Google suites um, of apps even though some of those are going to be incorporated they're still easily uh, easily created just by themselves so so our technology strategies. We did decide that we would use a collaboration site, and we used this university supported. And the reason that we did that, like I mentioned, is that we could then um, create what it looked like. It also meant that we could get into the collaboration sites and we could take a look at what was being done on them. It meant that we could use it. So for our project documents and some of our other communications, we could use this collaboration site and we could post those documents and make them available to the students. And we could control the design. Um, okay, I'm going to see if I can bring it up. <laughs> and as I said, as these are executive students, um, we wanted to keep that in mind in our design and making it as clear uh, and concise as possible, leaving as little room for confusion as we could. And actually, this actually looks even more confusing than it does for the students. This is the administrator site. For students, everything under administration is not there. Team member. Yeah. Okay. And so another piece that we did so to, to avoid confusion is in our introduction, we changed the introduction so that it included instructions on how to use it um, and what a discussion forum, a wiki, a calendar, a document, li cal document library, what all those things meant, getting started, how to use these different pieces, very step by step, like click on the left margin, um, let's see click on this button when you go into each one it says where to click what to write how to submit it and then we organized it we have a number of our different documents here um, guidelines and tips the project descriptions examples and then we organized it by section so an overview then we have introductions um, which is one of the first things that they take place in um, brainstorming and then we have a first deliverable section, a second deliverable section. So trying to make it as um, streamlined as possible was really important and one of the m big feedbacks that we've always heard from the students is they want to know it from the very beginning how, it, uh, how to use it. And in regards to Moodle, we also needed to make it very clear to the students, again, leaving as little room for interpretation as possible, that they wouldn't be graded for using Moodle. And we needed to allow for options and, and letting that decision-making power go to the students. And so um, providing uh, collaboration sites, providing information for the students, but leaving them to be um, more creative with how they were going to use it. Um, and I think that that's... So just in some 
in regards to the logistical um, aspects of working with this program is while um, it's often overlooked it's really the the foundation the bedrock for doing this for doing this project and making it successful and really um, launches us into this next part that Matthew will be talking about uh, in regards to the intercultural aspects of the international program so all right well as Teresa said um, as a staff working with the virtual team project we have to kind of wear two hats. We have to be aware of all the logistical details and making sure everything functions properly in that way. And we have to be aware, as people working in international education, about the intercultural learning process and how we can make that work best for our students. Um, so a few um, key points about um, intercultural learning process within the international setting of the virtual team project. We have learned from experience that with, in working with this group of students, um, that it works best to actually be implicit about intercultural learning rather than explicit. Um, we've discovered that our lens of intercultural learning, international education, is not the lens of our students. These are, these are executives working for um, often multinational companies. They're coming to this program and this project with a very different perspective. And so we have to be aware of that and figure out how can we best work with the, this population and um, sort of embed intercultural learning opportunities in the project rather than hitting them over the head with it. Um, next point, um, we've given a lot of thought to how can we design for experiential learning in a virtual environment. So how can we give students the feeling that they are um, experiencing and learning with and from each other when they're in most cases not interacting face to face. So how do we create that environment. And then lastly, I'll be talking about some of the specific intercultural communication challenges that we have observed our students and our student teams encountering as they, as they work through the virtual team project. So in terms of the first set of challenges that I'll talk about, um, Teresa mentioned earlier that these are executive MBA students. They, these are people who are working more than 40 hours a week in their jobs and on top of that um, enrolled in a very demanding executive MBA program. Um, and so one key point here in terms of challenges is that as the students come from the business world, they've been trained to think in terms of tangible, quantifiable outcomes. So that's, that's, that's their focus. So it's very easy for them to focus almost exclusively on the business plan that we're asking them to produce, financials, graphs, charts, and to not think about as much as we'd like without our prompting the cultural context. So both the cultural context of the market or markets where they're going to be launching this product or service and the cultural context of the teams that they're in. Um, so without kind of guide, guidance and some prompting and some embedding of this in the, in the project, that kind of learning may not happen naturally. Um, we have many of our students have had prior international experience, some quite a lot. And so we have some students who enter this project with the attitude of, I've been there, I've done that, I've done business in Dubai, I've been to Paris, I've been to New York, you know, what, what can I learn from this project that is different from my previous international experiences? And so how do we communicate the learning value and the value to the students, especially those who've traveled significantly before? So a couple of strategies that we've developed to, to help address these challenges. The first is um, how do we integrate reflective exercises and processes to help support and encourage student intercultural learning? And we have two examples. One is at the very beginning of the virtual team project, we provide the students with a few critical incidents of um, anonymous but actual examples of cultural challenges or intercultural issues that past teams have encountered. And we, at the very beginning, confront the students and say, th these are issues that past teams have had. You might want to think about what the issues were in these cases and how you might respond or handle these sorts of challenges if they come up in your own team. So we don't, we don't do a guided sort of process with the critical incidents. We simply give them to them and ask them to think about them in their own time to help at least hopefully raise their awareness at the beginning of the project that these issues may surface. Something that we've tried just this in this current cycle of the virtual team project is um, what we call the team process document, so, which very clearly lays out if a, an individual team member or a team is having an issue, whatever that issue may be, the emphasis in this step-by-step -step process document is empowering the students to communicate with each other to help solve whatever the issue or problem is. 
um, and to learn to develop those intercultural communication skills instead of immediately coming to Teresa or I or the staff or faculty at our partner schools and saying, you know, so-and-so isn't, isn't doing X, Y, or Z. Can you intervene and help solve this problem? That's, that's not what this project is about. The project is about, from an intercultural standpoint, the students learning to do this themselves. Um, we do know that it's important to acknowledge students' prior international experiences and to explain to them how the Virtual Team Project is a unique learning experience and that it combines a, the business world approach they're very familiar with as well as a, an academic approach. Um, and we, what we do from the very beginning in the project plan document that the students get in December is we communicate clearly the unique value of the Virtual Team Project and that it's not just about doing business but it's also about learning in a broader relational sense. And so we make clear that this project is about creating a solid, strong business plan, and it's an academic experience. And so it's the merging of these two that provides the, the unique learning opportunity. So next set of challenges are experiential challenges. Um, as I said earlier, how do we provide a virtual collaborative environment for the students? Um, how can they feel that they're learning um, and experiencing together when they're not able to interact face to face? Another challenge is um, we've learned or discovered or observed that our executive MBA students tend to be type A overachievers. And so what can we do to help support them in seeing that the virtual team project is not just another assignment to check off on their very long to-do list, um, but this is a unique learning experience that they really can benefit from investing significant time and effort in. So in terms of experiential strategies, um, Teresa has already mentioned um, the Moodle platform. Um, and I'll just add that although not all of our students use Moodle as extensively as others, we've spent a lot of time customizing the platform that, that Teresa showed, making it as interactive and collaborative as possible for those students and teams who choose to use it, including, as you saw, discussion forums, wikis, and chats. Um, we also spend time supporting students in recognizing the life lessons to be learned, um, if, that it's not just about getting the grade. Um, and we, what we've discovered is that sometimes this sort of reflection from the students, in fact, often it comes at the end or the conclusion of the project. Um, we've heard from several students that this was, they found the most meaningful learning experience of their degree program, often once it was all said and done, once the challenges had been faced and dealt with, and sometimes students will reflect on the strong cross-cultural friendships and relationships they formed. And so, although with the team process document, we make clear that we empower the students um, to figure out their own problems and team issues, um, at appropriate moments, we do coach students along the way, either Teresa or I, or more often, the staff and faculty in our partner schools, as they're more directly interfacing with the students. If a student is having an issue or is just concerned about what they're learning, challenges they may be having in a more sort of existential sense, that kind of individual coaching really helps. And it's great to see at the end of the project that, that students often really are able to sit back and reflect on all that they've learned, not only about business, but about the intercultural piece as well. So last set of challenges that I'll cover are some of the more specific intercultural communication challenges we've observed our students facing. In all three of these challenges, as so often the case with intercultural communication, we find that our students often make assumptions about one another based on a variety of factors. So for example, in terms of degree of participation, we've had scenarios where a, a team schedules a conference call and one student does not participate in the call. And so instead of the other team members communicating with that student and that colleague and saying, gosh, you weren't there, you know, what, can you tell us what happened? Teams can sometimes leap to assumptions about why so-and-so didn't join the call, and things very, can very quickly snowball and spiral. Uh, in terms of work styles, uh, we have some students who come from a cultural context where individual work and achievement is st are strongly, um, a strong focus on that. We have other students from cultural contexts where um, communal, uh, communal, uh, work is communal and decisions are made by consensus. And as an aside, the students in our China Executive MBA program, as a cohort of students, works and functions very communally prior to the start of this project. And so it's interesting to see how that sometimes flows over into these virtual teams when they're created cross-culturally. And then lastly, in terms of language, um, as Teresa said, all, all of our programs are taught in English, but there is a range of English language ability among our students. 
And sometimes students make assumptions about one another's intelligence or abilities based on their perception of other students' um, English language abilities. Um, not to mention that it's always more difficult to communicate virtually in your second or third language, which is the case for all but our, the students in our, our SEMBA program, our U.S. Executive MBA program. So with all of these intercultural communication challenges in mind, what are some of the, the strategies that we've utilized? Um, one is, and I think Teresa mentioned this earlier, is really encouraging the teams from the very beginning of the process to establish norms for themselves as a team, which is often a messy process, but that the learning that comes from that is valuable. So we encourage them to establish norms within their group around issues such as participation and work styles so that they can begin to have this kind of intercultural discussion from the beginning. They may not realize that that's what they're doing, but that is our sort of secret <laughs> goal for them to, to start doing. Um, this can be challenging for the students because the minute we, we roll out some information about the project, they want to get going right away on creating the business plan and move ahead with what they consider the real work, the meat of the real meat of the project. And this whole forming stage makes them really uncomfortable. So what we've discovered from this last year is that we may actually, we'll still have this forming stage, but we may shorten it slightly um, because this last fall, several teams were just extremely uncomfortable with this kind of ambiguous period where they were trying to, to figure out who they were and forming those, those team norms. So we're going to kind of look at that. And then just to revisit um, the team process document that I already mentioned, um, this document we found in really empowering students to figure out their own team issues, um, that this forces the students to, to develop stronger and more effective intercultural communication skills. So with us saying, you know what, you guys need to figure it out. And if you've really tried and if you've truly made your best effort to, to figure it out, then come to us. And what we've discovered in this last year is that only in maybe two occasions have teams not been able to figure it out on their own, which has been really, um, really encouraging. So we'll close here with um, a quote from a past participant from a couple of years back. Um, the VTP gave us a great opportunity to practice what we had learned, uh, to work with the EMBA students from different countries, and to really experience how global projects work. I believe the VTP will benefit me a lot in terms of sharpening my leadership and cross-cultural collaboration. So it's obviously great to hear students reflecting on the cross-cultural piece um, and the skills that they've gained in that regard from the project. So with that, we will take any questions that you might have. It uh, pertains to the slide you just had up there around norms, team yeah. norms and team process. Can you explain a little bit more the difference between the two? Because when I had, in my head when I think about process, I think about the relationship, the, the forming stage of a group. So how are those two different? I think, I'll take a stab and then Teresa if you want. Um, I th they're definitely related. Um, how we conceive of them differently in the context of this project is that um, the team norms are something that, that, that each individual team establishes on their own. So we give them suggestions about, you might want to think about different work styles, degree of participation, perceptions in that regard, but really it's up to the teams to form those for themselves so we don't get ourselves involved. The team process document is a document that we provide from the very beginning that outlines steps that show if you're having an issue, these are steps that we recommend you take in terms of really empowering the teams to solve their own problems. And so that's consistent across Exactly. And we have, so this last, this was the last, the first year that we've done that. Teresa, do you have anything else to add? Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Other questions? In the Skype discussions, is it possible that you can see all faces or is it just uh, audio? Uh, for conference calls for Skype, if it's more than two callers, then it's just audio. Um, but if it's just two people or two locations, then it can be video. Another question. Are those university li liaisons that you have in Warsaw and, and right. so on, do they also offer the degree? Is it a joint degree or is it just a U of M degree? And what role do their faculty have in your program? Okay. 
I can answer part of that question. Um, with the Vienna program, it is a joint degree uh, where the students attending that course uh, will receive a diploma from the, the VAU Executive Academy, the Vienna School of um, Economics and Business. With the Warsaw School of Economics, they receive a certificate. And with the China program, they uh, re receive the U of M diploma exclusively. Um, in regards to the faculty, um, with the both China and Warsaw programs, uh, our faculty partner with a local instructor, faculty member, um, and they will jointly offer the class, especially in, in, in China, um, that's definitely the case, and we'll work out a system of, um, of, of grading and of pre-module, post-module work. Uh, with the Vienna program, the class structure is slightly different in that the instructor from either Vienna or from the Carlson School will teach that entire module. So, do you have anything to add? Okay. Is the cost of the travel when they come here to do their presentations, is that incorporated in the tuition or the program fee? It is for the Warsaw uh, program, the Wemba program. It is not for the Chemba program or the Vemba program. Do you have any examples of student work that you could share? Some of the business plans? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Last year, the, one of the programs was Netflix in Poland. Um, a second was exporting the idea of the Viennese coffee house, and I don't remember what market they were working in. Do you remember, Mike? I think it was. Yeah, I can't remember. You know, a lot of work in China. <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a especially in the the classroom um, where Mike was. A lot of the programs were in were were the business plans were taking place in China. Um, a lot of them, I believe, in that were for. Um, programs for youth, for like preschoolers, and daycare in China. We've, we've also had, both last year and this year, several projects around gr um, green projects, so green energy, um, organic food. We have a really interesting project this year, where we haven't read through the whole project plan yet, related to the, I think it's called the Jaipur Foot, mm -hmm. which is a prosthetic that was originally developed in India, a very low cost prosthetic that this team is proposing rolling out and selling in, in developing countries all over the world. And so really it has kind of a social justice element to it in addition to a business element. So it was the bike rental one too. Oh right. We've had bike rental and then this year we have a um, I think a car car sharing service which is also another green energy. And so it really I was just going to say, it really does run the gamut, and um, it also really, I think, is a reflection of the diversity of the students, because we'll have, the, uh, from, from many different aspects of business, um, green business, um, green initiatives, excuse me, also medical, um, I believe, in addition to the prosthetics, um, there were some programs of uh, opening up specialized clinics. Um, let's see, care for the elderly. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of diversity in the project plans. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, oh one, one more. more. <laughs> Last one. So do you have an example of maybe a bigger cultural problem that um, a team has come to you with that you had to maybe get involved with to help solve? Yeah. I'm sure we can look at which one. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if you agree, Teresa, I, I think what we've discovered thinking through this year, the couple of incidences where issues have escalated to, to where us having to get involved, it's, it, it, um, it might circulate around um, one individual on a team and the perception of the other team members that that individual is not, for, for example, contributing enough. Um, and then when you dig down a little bit, um, you find out that this particular student might have had um, a major illness or a family issue, and they may not have really communicated that to their teammates, which is mm -hmm. often cultural as well, that they have not communicated it. Um, and so 
sometimes in these situations, it's just about reminding the teams how important it is to open those lines of communication. Um, with that said, every year we have one or two teams that they're not going to probably remain the best of friends at the conclusion of the project, and that's just too, that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. um, so we do our best to enforce that they need to work on their issues. We'll get involved as staff or faculty to help, and then ultimately, though, it is up to the team to work it out. And right, I just want to reiterate that last piece, um, really communicating to the students that we, we may be able to um, kind of insert ourselves into the into the into this issue or make suggestions, but ultimately we cannot change student behavior, um, and so that's really up to the individual students, um, and it's the responsibility of the teams. And I would just add as a closing point that. We do have built into the grade of the virtual team project a participation percentage, and we have something we actually should have mentioned earlier was that we have the students do oh, peer right. evaluation surveys throughout the entire project. So in addition to the final team project report and presentation, which is you know, group work, the, the students at four points along the way evaluate each other, and that goes into the final grade. So if there's someone who's really truly not contributing, that will show up, and that is taken into account in terms of their final grade. Can I just ask a follow-up question? I wanted to ask about um, your methods for assessing the implicit goal of the cross-cultural learning. And it sounds like this peer review gets at some of it probably, but is there any formal evaluation of what are they gaining cross-culturally um, in addition to the presentation of the final project at the end of the program? I, I think to be honest at this point, um, the, the, that kind of assessment has been anecdotal. It comes from conversations with students after their presentations and the years after their, they finish the virtual team project along the way. We do get some of that feedback in the surveys. We ask, in addition for feedback about their teammates, we ask them to give feedback about the process as a whole and what they've learned. And so we do get some of that feedback there as well. Um, but that could be something we could look at too in getting some more, you know, formalizing that. Looks like we have two minutes left, so unless there are any other pressing questions, thank you all for coming. Yeah, it was it was a pleasure.